we have Karen McGill and the Abled Ones. So Karen is going to be talking about the Abled Ones. She was forced um, to leave the workforce in 2000 by a string of chronic illness. And she took that opportunity to pursue her dream of writing. And now she's an avid writer as well as a public speaker. So she's going to come up and share her story. Come on up. Next slide, please. One in seven Canadians lives with a physical disability. Did you know the number was that high? I didn't. But it shouldn't be surprising because many of us live with invisible disabilities. Next slide. My story starts on June 5th, 2000. My alarm sounds and I roll over to turn it off but my left arm didn't move. I moved around and turned it off with the right. Then I went to get out of bed, but as soon as I put weight on my legs, the left one collapsed underneath me. I lay there on the carpet, trying to wake up, wondering what was going on with my body, and realizing I had to go to the bathroom with one arm, I managed to, it was a very short distance to, from my bedroom to the bathroom, but dragged my body there. After I'd taken care of business, there was some feeling and strength returning to the left leg, and I propped myself against the vanity. While brushing my teeth, I noticed that the left side of my face didn't move. It was as if someone had drawn an invisible line down the center of my body. This side, this side worked, this side not so much. Raise your hand if you'd be scared if you woke up like this. What would you do? Go to the hospital? 911, call a doctor, call a friend? Me? I went to work. <laughs> Once at work, I called and made a doctor's appointment. He poked and prodded me and asked me some questions before sending me to the hospital across the street. Next. I sat in the emergency waiting room at St. Paul's Hospital, where my grandmother died of a brain tumor in 1937. And I started to wonder if maybe I had a brain tumor. I also started to realize just how fast your life can change. The night before when I'd gone to bed, my thoughts were all on work. I had a great job with the Canadian government. Uh, my one year anniversary was coming up on June 14th, and that's when my probationary period would be over. Um, all my benefits would kick in, and I would be secure in a government job. Like I say, life was pretty good that Sunday night. I mean, there were some negatives. The blind date I'd gone on the night before hadn't gone well, and I had some weight to lose, but all in all, I was pretty happy with my life. I waited five hours before getting to see a doctor. The emergency room doctor examined me, told me he didn't think I had a brain tumor, whew, nor did he think I'd had a stroke. He didn't know what was going on. He leaves, and then he's replaced by a neurology intern who poked and prodded me and asked me some questions before disappearing. By this time, I was fed up. I didn't care anymore. Okay, that's a lie, because I did care what was happening. But I wanted to go home. I was tired. I was hungry. I wanted a cigarette. Finally. After seven and a half hours, I got to go without any answers. Two days later, I went to see a neurologist. He pokes and prods me and asks me some questions. I tried to be a good patient. I really did. But I was finally starting to get scared. My mother had come to the appointment with me. And when we left, I turned to her and I said, Mom, 
I'm afraid that one night I'm going to go to sleep and not wake up. She took my hand in hers, and she said, then you call me every morning, so you have to wake up. I've got a pretty great mom, don't I? I really wanted to know what was going on with me, but it was more than that. Next. In 1984, I went horseback riding, and the horse had a heart attack and fell on me, cracking my skull. Ever since then, I'd had strange things going on with my body. Sudden numbness in my limbs, unexplained pains. I go to doctors to get it checked out, but they'd never find anything and tell me it was all in my mind. But you see, I knew it wasn't. I knew this was real. Now, I was afraid that they would uh, once again find nothing. So I'd be left with symptoms and no answers. On June 14th, after an MRI, the neurologist calls me in, looks at me and says, multiple sclerosis. This was good news. <laughs> I mean, at least at first, I finally had an answer to what was going on with me. Finally had a name I could put to it. As my late father said, the devil you know is the one, the devil you know is better than the one you don't. Next. One of the first things I can remember thinking, and don't ask me why, is that I'll never again be able to climb that 2.9 kilometer hike up the side of Grouse Mountain. No one has a grouse grind. That was quickly replaced with, thank God I don't have to climb the grind again. Diagnosis in hand, I thought I'd take some time off work, then go back, to my usual schedule, everything would be fine. Yeah, I was wrong. Have you ever heard that saying, man plans, God laughs? That's what was happening here. I took five weeks off work and went back to my old schedule. Unfortunately, I couldn't handle it. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease in which the immune system attacks itself. And what it attacks is the myelin sheath covering your nerves. It leaves little patches of scarring tissue. And that's why people have problems with their mobility and their speech and eyesight is because the message from the brain isn't getting to whatever, to the limbs or wherever. One of the main problems with MS is chronic fatigue. And I was exhausted all the time. But I couldn't afford to work part-time, because if I had to go on disability, they would base it on my part-time hours. And I needed my wage replacement to be on my full-time hours. At the end of September, I went to the UBC clinic, or the MS clinic at UBC, and there the doctors and I decided that it would be better off if I went on disability. I was devastated. MS took the best job I'd ever had away from me. A job it took me a year and a half to get. I was 35 years old, and I thought that my life was over. All I could see was me sitting alone in a one-bedroom apartment, watching television, and just existing. Maybe surrounded by a bunch of cats. The next few months, next, were a struggle for me. I was constantly fighting with the insurance companies to get the money that I deserved. Plus, I was trying to adjust to my new life, my new existence. And top that off, with the stress caused me to have more symptoms, things like leg tremors, pain, numbness, trouble swallowing, the list goes on. It seemed that every day something new was happening. There were nights that I actually prayed I wouldn't wake up the next morning. But all things, good and bad, come to an end. And by the end of January 2001, I had my payments in place, a budget worked out, and the MS was calming down a bit. Now it was time for me to think of my future. When I went on disability, I had to take a 30% cut in income. 
Add to that the fact that I also owed my employer for the sick time they advanced me back in June. And they took a bit off each check for years. 2002, I filed for bankruptcy. And my life was a series of emotions, ups and downs and symptoms for a few years there. But I was getting the rest I needed and I was adjusting. I was also at a critical juncture in my life. Now, I could choose to give up, to focus on every ache, pain, and symptom, to curse the medical field for not finding a cure, or I could realize what a gift I've been given. Does anyone know what that gift is? It was get the chance to start over. I have a chance to recreate myself, to maybe accomplish some dreams. Next. All my life, I've always dreamed of being a published author. Now, I have five books published. My first book, The Bond, A Paranormal Love Story, has been translated into Turkish. It's won an award, and it's being adapted to film. I have a budding career as a motivational speaker and a life coach. And last year, I got an email from someone in the Rick Hansen Foundation asking me to be part of the Rick Hansen Ambassador Program. And Rick Hansen himself is the one who suggested me. Now, this is not my pre-MS life. This is way better. <laughs> and I'm not going to try to sound modest here, but I haven't done anything that anyone else can't do. Just because you can become disabled does not mean that you lose your dreams. They just may have to change a bit. Don't you agree? Unfortunately, not everyone thinks so. One night, I got into a discussion with somebody on Facebook. Next. Actually, <laughs> it was more like a heated argument. <laughs> Our fingers were flying across those keyboards. We were discussing whether someone with a lower income can improve their lives simply by changing their spending habits. Now, she first accused me of poor shaming. And then this person who I'll call Gertrude said something that really shocked me. She said that those with a disability, can, either mental or physical, can't improve their lives. And then I started to think, is that the way society sees us? Apparently so. In a recent study done by Angus Reid and the Rickanson Foundation, it found that 50% of Canadians believe that accessibility is a human right, not a privilege. But the same people also say they can understand if an employer is fearful of hiring someone with a disability. You know, I started to think about what I've done and what other people with disabilities have done, like Terry Fox, Rick Hansen, Tim Harris. Now, Fox and Hansen's exploits are legendary, but Harris's are just as important. Tim was born in 1986 with Down syndrome, and in 2010, he opened his own restaurant, Tim's Place, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Now, that is only four people who have done great things. I know somebody else here who uh, has a disability and has done great things with their life. And I bet you people can all think of somebody too. But I've also found that when people with challenges get the courage up to pursue dreams, they make three common mistakes. Num next, the first mistake they do is that they focus on what they can't do rather than what they can. All they see is the dis, not the ability. I once received a letter from Rick Hansen in which he told me to focus on what I can do and do the best with what I have. When I do that, I find I can do so much more than I ever dreamed I was capable of. Next. The second mistake people make is that they're afraid to start. They've got this goal, it's way up here, and they're way down here. All they can see is that big distance, and they don't know how they're going to get there. 
They're afraid to start. They're afraid of losing everything they built already. So they don't. They just sit at home and dream. Next. Mistake number three is that they're trying to do it all alone. They don't know who to turn for who to turn to for help or who will understand their unique challenges. So they try to do it all alone, hit an obstacle, and give up. Now all these mistakes are correctable. And I'm the person to help them do it because I've been through it all. I've come a long way from that 35 year old who thought her life was over just because she had lost a good career and was told she'd never work again. Now, I want to see changes in the way that society and people themselves view the disabled. That's why I started next, the 90-day turnaround, how to transform the quality of your life starting today coaching program. And next week, I am launching a money program to help people in debt change their lives by changing their spending. After all, aren't, the debt, aren't those in debt also disabled? With these programs, my books, and my speaking, I want to take those that society and people like Gertrude have given up on and have them prove that they can do more than they ever thought possible. At a conference in December, someone I really admire told me that I was like that person, next, in an obstacle course, reaching over the wall to help the last person. But just think, if we can help these people, the chronically ill, the disabled, those who've given up on life, those who are drowning in debt, help them improve their lives, and they pay it forward, next, think about how many hands are gonna be reaching over that wall to help. Thank you for your time.